Okay, George. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome back, everyone. And uh, we're going to deal now with the second matter for de debate. Is the Eucharist a propitiatory sacrifice? And Patrick now has 15 minutes to make the case for propitiation. I don't know why it's the timer. Mm -hmm. Put on this little microphone. Right. Propitiation, uh, I looked, had to look it up again to be absolutely, well, as clear as I, I can be. And the definition seemed to be to appease uh, uh, someone angry, in this case, uh, God. That is never um, what I received from Eucharistic theology, that God had to be placated in that way. Uh, rather, I, saw, I, see, I see it, and I think the church sees it also, as the making present uh, in, in, the, in the celebration of the Mass, making present the once and for all finished, perfect work of Christ that we can avail of it. And I notice in some of your hymns in the evangelical tradition about for example, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's you know, that one. And there's others uh, talking about the cross, talking about Calvary, uh, bring me to Calvary. And that's, that's what we understand about the sacrifice of the Mass. It is not and has been misrepresented as a repeat of, of, the, of the cross. It's not. It never has been taught by the church that the Mass repeats again and again and again, the once and for all sacrifice that Jesus offered. But that, the grace and the blessings and everything that he achieved uh, in that offering of himself is celebrated in the Mass. It is represented, it is brought. Uh, we don't see the hill of Calvary. It's like an eternal moment and in the Mass, of course, it's in an un unbloody manner that his, his sacrifice on the cross was, was bloody, as we know. But the grace of Calvary and of the resurrection are made present among the people so that we can grow in grace, so that we can avail of the blessings that Christ has achieved for us. It's an offering that he makes himself. He makes his offering present. And we gather around that offering. We gather to um, benefit from it and to avail of, of all that he gives us, all the graces, the many graces that he gives us in the Eucharist. We believe it, it is. It is the celebration of his eternal triumph. And it is his victory made present, which we remember in, in a living way. Not in, a, not in a sort of looking back, as I said earlier in time, but as the living memorial, that's a very important phrase that we, but we believe about the, the, the Mass. It is the living memorial of, of the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes. The glory of Christ in heaven, we cannot see, but we, we can see it by faith. And that's the crucial thing here always, as I've said earlier, faith. And just um, when you mentioned about uh, Thomas, I was thinking of Thomas, actually, and the Lord said to him, there, there were some witnesses, of course, but he also said, happy are those who, who have not seen and yet believe. So believing as we do, um, we have to take certain things on faith. We, we can't travel back 2,000 years but we believe on the witness of those disciples and apostles and on the, the record of the scriptures and that for, for over 2,000 years now, 
uh, Christians, Catholics, other Christian groups have uh, believed in Christ, have loved him, have put their hope and trust in him, and believe what he told them, and not just, not just talking about the Eucharist, but we believe all those things that, that he told us in the scriptures, and that you, some of which you have read. And uh, the important point that I want to make is that it is not a repeat. The, the Mass is not the, is like the sacrifices of the old law, which, which priests have to repeat over and over again because they the, uh, take away their own sins and the sins of the people. The lamb who was slain on the cross is the one who finished all that and established his perfect unending sacrifice by which the God the Father is glorified and by which we are built up and strengthened in the communion of the Holy Spirit whom the Father shares with his Son. And it is that spirit that affects the, the, the sacrifice. Yes, the Holy Spirit is invoked always at Mass before the, the words of consecration. And we see that as a work of the Spirit and makes real and, and available all the, the, the great things that the Lord ac accomplished when he went to Calvary two th over 2,000 years ago. So that's, that's where I stand. That's where the church stands. And uh, it's, it's very often uh, some Protestants have misrepresented the, the, the Mass as, as a repeat of Calvary. That is not what we believe. We believe it is the infinite love of God, uh, propitiation in the sense that things had to be put right with God, and only God could put things right. And that's why Jesus came into the world, to bring the love of the Father into the world, to uh, pour forth the Holy Spirit. And he gave us, we believe, the Eucharist as the abiding memorial until he returns in glory. And it's the love of God who cares for human beings, God who so loved the world that he gave up his only son. It's not, and I don't see it, I have never seen it as trying to placate an angry God. I don't believe that that's what the church holds to. Some of the language of the past may have um, given that impression, but there, there has been developments in theology and different understandings and different insights where God actually is the one who takes the initiative. God is the one who comes to find us and save us. And the, the ultimate gesture, expression of that is his, the death of his beloved son and his resurrection from the dead. And the mass proclaims both your death and resurrection until you come again. So, I, I, as I know what, I haven't given up my full time yet. Have I much left? Or? I have about seven minutes. Seven minutes. Mm. Well, I think, no, I think I've said as much as I could say. I mean, it might unfold in the questions a bit more, you know. Okay, Patrick, thank you. Rob, your case against propitiation. The Eucharist in the Roman Catholic religion is another name for Holy Communion. The term comes from the Greek by way of Latin, and it means thanksgiving. It is used in three ways. First, to refer to the real presence of Christ. Second, to refer to Christ's continuing action as high priest. And third, to refer to the sacrament of Holy Communion itself. We read these words from the Catholic Catechism. The Lord, having loved those who were his own, loved them to the end, knowing that the hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. In the course of a meal, he washed their feet and gave them the commandment of love. In order to leave them a pledge of this love, in order never to depart from his own and to make them sharers in his Passover, he instituted the Eucharist, as the memorial of his death and resurrection and commanded his apostles to celebrate it until his return. Thereby he constituted them priests of the New Testament, end quote. 
In order to eat the flesh of Jesus Christ and drink the blood of Jesus Christ, the Roman Catholic religion relies upon the narrative of the Last Supper or the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night he was betrayed. Hence, it is in the synoptic accounts of this event that we must turn to see if Rome is accurate with scripture. Rome claims that Jesus actually turned the bread of the Passover meal into his body, blood, soul, and divinity, and the wine into his blood at one point in the meal. And thus he gave himself to be eaten and drank by his disciples. It is further claimed that he gave his disciples the command and authority to do the same after his departure, thus making them priests of a new covenant. It is further claimed that this Eucharist or Thanksgiving serves the purpose of being able to offer Jesus Christ as an unbloody sacrifice to God in the Roman Catholic Mass and to be eaten by the faithful Roman Catholic for, among other things, the forgiveness of sins. But did Jesus actually do all of this at the Passover meal? We read this account of the Passover meal in Matthew chapter 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. There is absolutely no reason to think that Jesus was not using bread as a figure for his own body, soon to be crucified on the cross. Those who heard him say, this is my body, would have known that it was a figure. He was standing in front of them in full body form. There is simply no indication that they thought Jesus had made a piece of bread his actual body. Jesus, this very night, will call himself the true vine, and his disciples will be called the branches. This is figurative language. Jesus was not calling himself a vine nor did he transubstantiate himself into a vine in front of them. When Jesus says, this is the blood of the New Testament, he meant that the wine represented the blood shed on the cross. It could not have been the blood of Jesus flowing through his veins since Christ had not yet been crucified. How then could the so-called transubstantiated wine be the blood of Calvary when Calvary had not even taken place yet. Jesus does not refer to the alleged transubstantiated wine as his blood after giving it to his disciples. He calls it the fruit of the vine. Remember what he said after giving them his uh, cup of wine and after giving them a piece of bread, he says these words. I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. He does not say, I will not drink henceforth my blood. He calls it the fruit of the vine. Also, the Apostle Paul identifies the bread as bread and the wine as the cup throughout his discourse on taking the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight 28 and following. He never refers to the bread as the actual body, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul never refers to the cup or the wine as the actual blood of Jesus Christ. The entire episode of the Last Supper is in the context of the Passover meal. The Passover meal is highly symbolic and designed with figures and symbols to remind Israel of the night that the angel of death passed over the killing of Israel's infants. Even the Passover itself is a symbol and figure of God passing over the sins of his people and mitigating their judgment for the cross of Christ. 
Hence, for Jesus to say, this is my body and this is my blood would fit the context and mindset of the disciples who knew precisely the symbolic significance of the Passover. Furthermore, there is no sacrificial blood or sacrificial flesh at the Last Supper. There's no mention of a sacrifice. There is no mention of sins forgiven. The elements of wine and bread both look forward to the once and for all time sacrifice at Calvary. Jesus bid his disciples to look forward to his real shed blood and his real sacrificed body. Both Jesus and Paul bid them to always remember by use of these symbols. We now turn our attention to the propitiatory nature of the Roman Catholic Mass. We read these words in paragraph 1367 of the Catholic Catechism. Quote, the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. Note the word sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. Note the word victim. The same now offers through the ministry of priest who then offered himself on the cross. Victim, sacrifice, offer. Only the manner is different. And since in this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody matter on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner, this sacrifice is truly propitiatory. Now, I don't know what church my opponent attends or officiates over, but for him to say that it is not the teaching of the Catholic religion that the Eucharistic celebration in their mass is not an unbloody sacrifice offered up to God for the remission of sin, complete with a victim and a priest offering Jesus Christ himself in the person of Christ is simply to misrepresent the Roman Catholic religion. It can't be said any clearer than what I've just quoted. This sacrifice is truly propitiatory. The offering of Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for sins by a Roman Catholic priest is the same sacrifice represented, only the manner of offering is different. It is the same victim, Jesus Christ, only offered in an unbloody manner on the altar of the Roman Catholic Mass. Christ is said to be contained in and sacrificially killed. The word is emulated at the hands of a Roman Catholic priest. The Lord is said to be pleased by this oblation. The benefits or fruit of the original blood at Calvary are received through the unbloody sacrifice at the altar of the Roman Catholic priest. This unbloody sacrifice is said to be propitiatory not only for the living, but for the dead. And the word propitiation means satisfaction. In theological parlance, it means that God's wrath is satisfied against sin for all those who come to the altar of the Roman Catholic Mass. This is quite a bit more than simply sharing in the benefits of what Jesus has done. A greater understatement was never made of the Roman Catholic Mass. Paragraph 1393 of the New Catholic Catechism says, Holy Communion separates us from sin. The body of Christ we receive in Holy Communion is given up for us, and the blood we drink shed for the many for the forgiveness of sins. For this reason, the Eucharist cannot unite us to Christ without at the same time cleansing us from past sins and preserving us from future sins. If you're not participating in the Roman Catholic Mass, you don't get this. You don't get a cleansing from sin and you don't get a preservation from future sins. What is our response to all this? Well, first of all, the doctrine of transubstantiation is not true, thus rendering the entire oblation of the Roman Catholic Mass untenable. There is no victim. There is no Jesus Christ. There is no real sacrifice. This ought to be the end of it. But let's examine the Roman Catholic Eucharist at this point and the emulation of Christ and see why precisely it is strictly anti-Christian. The Roman Catholic priest is bound by the same limitations of the Levitical priesthood. 
The Roman Catholic priest offers blood that is not his own, just like the Levitical priest. Roman Catholic priests offer a sacrifice for himself and the people, just like the Levitical priests who were not perfect. Roman Catholic priests offer this sacrifice over and over again, just like the Levitical priests. The Roman Catholic priest ministers at an earthly altar made with human hands, just like the Levitical priest. In contrast to all of this, Jesus Christ offered his own blood, not the blood of others. Jesus did not offer his blood for his own sins, since he had no sin. His blood is the only pure offering in the universe. Jesus did not offer himself often, but only once. Jesus offered himself in the heavenly tabernacle, not made with hands, or of this earth. Jesus is the only one who can serve at his altar. Hence, the entire Roman Catholic Eucharistic propitiatory sacrifice of an unbloody Jesus is anti-Christian. It's simply not Christianity. Listen to Hebrews chapter 7. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. In reality, the claim that Roman Catholic priests have been commissioned by God to offer the blood and body of Jesus Christ over and over again is simply the exact opposite of Christianity. Hebrews 9, for Christ is not entered into the holy place with made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then he must have suffered often since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. In reality, the claim that Roman Catholic priests offer a sacrifice that removes venial sins is utterly contrary to New Testament revelation. In the first place, the blood of Christ covers all sins, not just venial sins. If the Roman Catholic unbloody sacrifice of Christ were really the same sacrifice as Calvary, then it would put away mortal sin as well. But Rome says it does not. And if it does not, it is not a true sacrifice of Christ. Yet one more reason to say that this Roman Catholic sacrifice has nothing to do with Christianity or the forgiveness of sins. Rob, you and I could be first questions to public on propitiation. <clears throat> Patrick, I've been studying the Roman Catholic position on arriving at this unbloody propitiatory sacrifice of Christ. And one of the ways that they like to proof text it from the Bible is by use of Malachi in the Old Testament and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. The Council of Trent says this, the Eucharist is a clean oblation which cannot be defiled by the unworthiness or malice of those that offer it. The Lord foretold this through the prophecy of Malachi. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians has clearly indicated that they who are defiled